Good afternoon and welcome to the University of Manitoba Alumni and Friends Virtual Learning for Life program. My name is Tracy Bowman and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and a proud University of Manitoba alumna. Thank you for joining us and making this event part of your day. We're able to provide this program free to all of our alumni and friends thanks to the very generous sponsorship of our affinity partner, IA Financial Group. Many thanks to them. You can learn more about the insurance options that they offer at UM Alumni also on our alumni website. So before we get started, just a few housekeeping details. Today's session is being recorded as per usual and will be posted to our website and the YouTube channel in the next day or two. So please keep watch for that. I encourage you to check out all of our previous other lectures that are also on the YouTube channel. There's between 24 and 26 sessions. There are lots of great content that will always be available to you. So please do check those out. Uh, when we sent you this reminder email, again, as usual, we use Slido as our main form of collecting questions from all of you who are watching. Uh, that website is Slido, S-L-I-D-O.com, and today's password is for the date, V-L-F-L-1. Now, last week, we also took questions from YouTube, so you're welcome. If, if that's easier for you and you'd like to post them right into YouTube while you're watching, that is just fine. You can do that as well. We'll try to get through as many questions as we can. Last week, we had lots of questions. I encourage the same thing to happen again, and we'll try to get through them within, within the hour presentation. So I'm delighted to introduce today's presenter who is presenting, not for the first, not the second, but the third time in a row in this fall 2021 Virtual Learning for Life session. Dr. Stefan Flugmakor Lima. And the topic is CSI Ecotoxicology Mysterious Flamingo Deaths in the Rift Valley Lakes. Now, I, I want to just let you know that I know that he's alluded to the fact that he can speak to uh, a topic on clean water and blue green algae, which I know is of importance and of interest to all of us in Manitoba with the health of Lake Winnipeg. But don't worry, we will be bringing him back for that presentation in 2022. So stay tuned for that. So those of you who haven't, who maybe this is the first time that you're he hearing from Dr. Flugmaker Lima, let me tell you a little bit about him. He is the Dean of the University of Manitoba's, uh, University of Manitoba's Clayton H. Riddell Faculty of Environment, Earth and Resources. He received his PhD from the University of Munich and served as a full professor of ecological impact research and ecotoxicology at the Technical University of Berlin. He's also a professor of aquatic ecotoxicology in an urban environment at the University of Helsinki, where he runs a joint laboratory of applied ecotoxicology with the Korean Institute of Science and Technology. He's also held administrative roles at the universities I mentioned, Technical University of Berlin and the University of Helsinki, in addition to serving the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, the German Research Foundation, Lithuanian Research Council, and as an advisory board member of the Cancer Research and Biotechnology AG in Switzerland. So with that, over to you, Dr. Flugmaker Lima. Thank you very much, Tracy, for the nice introduction. And yes, uh, sorry that that it's me again for the third <laughs> time. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, let's let's start with that. Uh, I made the title a little bit more appealing: CSI Ecotoxicology, mm -hmm. and let's see how it goes. But first, I would like to uh, do this traditional territories acknowledgement. The University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oikri, Dakota, and Dene peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Okay, let's go to the topic. Um, when, you, when you go to Africa, to, to some of their lakes, and you, you fly over them, you see these pink and white bands on the shorelines. And all these pink lines you see here, that's flamingos already. The white is salt crystals. So you can see that here on several pictures. Um, and um, it's a very huge population which you have on these African reef valley lakes. So that's when you get a little bit closer. You can see the, the different birds on that. There are two different ones. There's the greater flamingos and the lesser flamingos. 
And uh, what I will show you today is a little bit research on the lesser flamingos, which are the smaller species of that. So I had the big luck of uh, working on the reefed valley lakes. And uh, if you go to the map, you see uh, the big lake here is Lake Victoria. And then you have the reefed valley lakes going up to Ethiopia. And I was able to visit most of them during the research. I was doing that on that um, on these mysterious flamingo deaths. And yes, we have um, some, some deaths uh, recordings and it starts already in 1991 with 40,000 carcasses on that in Bogoria and Nakuru. And it uh, made our way until uh, 2008 uh, with 30,000 in Bogoria. And um, these are numbers which are quite frightening and concerning. Um, and that's what it looks about. So you have dead flamingos laying on the shorelines. And of course, when you spend a decent amount of money for going on a, on a safari, on a photo safari, like the people on the left picture, then you don't want to see thousands of dead birds laying around. What the park uh, rangers uh, doing uh, was removing them in the early mornings as best as they could. But uh, imagine to remove 40 or 30,000 dead flamingos, that's a big task and uh, that's not always possible. So with that, um, my phone was ringing when I was professor in Berlin and um, I had uh, people on this phone asking me to do something on that. So that was our Federal Ministry of Education and Research, BMBF. And they asked me to investigate a little bit why the flamingos are dying there. And that's in cooperation, of course, with uh, some universities in uh, Kenya. So I was putting my jacket on, I was taking my class and uh, I started my CSI ecotoxicology work. Um, we named our group like that um, to, to make it more fancy, of course, CSI ecotoxicology. So I jumped in an airplane, which uh, during that time was much easier than nowadays. Um, and I was flying uh, to Kenya, to Nairobi, and uh, going to uh, these reef valley lakes um, and have a look at the situations there. So one of the lakes I was visiting was Lake Nakuru in uh, Nakuru National Park in Kenya. And um, that's an aerial view from Google Earth. And you can already see there's some green uh, colors in this lake. And we will, I will show you later what that really means. So going there uh, from Nairobi to these Reef Valley Lakes in the first uh, few kilometers, uh, the street is pretty well uh, and you can drive very well on that. And then afterwards, the streets are looking a little bit like that. And it takes ages to make some kilometers and arriving at this lake. But that's the interesting fun part of that, uh, driving on these kind of roads. When I arrived there with my colleague, um, it was in the late afternoon evening. The sun was going down and it was a very peaceful atmosphere. You can see that on, on the photos here directly at the lake. Uh, some people were just uh, getting some water out of the lake and birds flying around and bats. And it was really nice. And it was this kind of out of Africa feeling which you can get. So you get back to your to your uh, little hut and then you, you have your sundowner and everything seems nice. Um, on the next morning, this impression was just disturbed a little bit by going back to the lake and seeing the dead flamingos laying around. Um, and uh, that's not very um, uh, not very nice. Um, the numbers we saw there were quite frightening. So there were really a lot of them laying around several thousands. And that's, of course, something uh, where we have to look at why are they dying on that. Um, we met these uh, three fellows here. Um, they were making a business out of the dead birds, uh, which is in a way good. So they, they just get the feathers from the dead birds and they made these beautiful flowers out of them. I, I still have one of them in my in my office at home. But uh, the most important when you look at these kids is um, look at the water bottle. Um, so they take the water out of the same lake where hundreds and thousands of flamingos were dying. And that's, of course, from a concern. They drink the same water um, as where the flamingos were drinking and feeding on. So 
we have to keep that in mind during the next slides and during the whole lecture. So CSI ecotoxicology, um, why are the birds dying? And um, of course we were just uh, looking at the literature, what is going on? We just uh, talked with tons of people around the lake in the cities. Um, um, we saw the rose farmers farming uh, from uh, the Netherlands, which are directly at the lake. Um, so there, there's for sure several uh, contaminants which might count for the death of these birds. So in the morning when we was waking up, uh, we saw the lake like that. Uh, clean like a spinach soup um, and um, yeah that's the shoreline so the smell was really incredible um, there were also dead fish swimming around in this lake um, and uh, we had this typical cyanobacterial bloom formation and when the wind is driving the whole bloom to the shoreline you can see them um, really getting a thick uh, layer on the surface of the water of course, this uh, <clears throat> is um, this is, these are my legs. Just to mention it, so I was taking the risk uh, going into the water and uh, taking some samples, well knowing that these cyanobacterial plumes in this density, they might be really uh, dangerous because these cyanobacteria can have a lot of secondary metabolites which are toxic for us. And this is how it looks like. Um, under the microscope, when you just sample this green soup, uh, you see a lot of different cyanobacteria and they are beautiful. I can look for ages under the microscope for them. They have different forms, shapes and all these. But of course, as an ecotoxicologist and toxicologist, I keep in mind that they can have a lot of these secondary metabolites, which we call cyanobacterial toxins. They have the microcystins, which are over a hundred variants on that, um, which are heptapeptides, so seven amino acids making this ring, and they account for, example, liver cancer and lung cancer. The same with nodularine, it's a pentapeptide, so five amino acids also making you liver cancer. Then we have BMAA, beta methyl amino alanine. It's a little amino acid, which uh, is in the um, yeah, which might count for Alzheimer and Parkinson diseases. And then we have uh, anatoxin, um, anatoxins with meanwhile, so there are more than one, and they are called the sudden death factor. So these are neurotoxins, which can kill you quite rapidly. And we have cell toxins like cylindrospermopsins. Uh, also, there are several variants on that. And this can be synthesized by these blue-green algae, by these cyanobacteria, um, and making even for humans health issues. So what we did is we uh, had our, our bungalows there um, and uh, we set up an, an outdoor lab. Um, we had uh, pumps with us to filter water and uh, to put the cyanobacteria on a filter to dry them and to bring them back to Berlin. And um, we were doing our work, starting our work uh, as you can see, so filtering water um, until out of a sudden um, the energy was not available anymore. And then you can see it from my PhD student. She was then pressing um, the water with our medical syringe uh, through this filter cartridge. Um, and um, on the next picture, you can see that one o'clock in the morning we were still working and pressing water through filter cartridges which is really hard work and we had some some uh, really nice scars on our hands after that work um, but there was no energy and we have to go on so that was the way to go to take our syringes and just put it through uh, as long as it might take yeah as you can see back on the lake the flamingos and then in front of that you have the the marabous um and they are the cleanup uh birds on that so every dead bird is um picked up by marabous and they they have a, a nice technique they drill a hole in the back of the the flamingo and then they just pour out the soft tissues the heart the intestine and the stomach and eat that yeah that's what we saw um, when we are watching the birds, um, we saw birds staggering around 
Um, they look like a little bit like trunk, but um, they are not. They were not able to keep the head up anymore. So actually, what we recognized when we were watching these birds, they were dying um, sometimes because of not getting enough air anymore. So they were just drowning in the water and, and that was it. And then the marabou came and finished it up sometimes. So they were just waiting on these poor birds uh, staggering around and then they were just uh, making them a quick end. On that, um, we were thinking about, and of course, scientists, we develop a hypothesis and we can work on that. So I hope our hypothesis was cyanobacteria and their toxins contribute to flamingo death. So when you look at um, the lesser flamingos in the middle of the, the, the row here, you see that they are filtrating um, these uh, algae out of the water. That's their normal food, normal food, green algae. The greater flamingos, they eat more uh, shrimps and crustaceans, and that's why they, their feathers are more, um, more these pink and dark orange than from the lesser flamingos. The lesser flamingos are more the vegetarians on that. And then, of course, we can think about that the toxins produced by cyanobacteria will might accumulate in the flamingos and then also might accumulate uh, in um, the marabus on that. What we saw is a lot of these birds, and they were laying very, very similar in that way. Uh, if you if you pick them up from the from the ground, they stay exactly like that. They stay like a hardwood. Um, you can't really bend the neck anymore. You will break the bones if you do that, and that's how we saw many of these birds on that. Um, the same here and here, also in these little pictures. I know it's unpleasant, but that's how it's life. Uh, you see already the hole which the marabou was drilling in the carcasses to get out the soft tissue from the flamingos. Yeah, that is our camp. Um, just to show you the, the living conditions for, for us as a researcher, um, you see the, the shower place, uh, what we have here with this red bucket. We had to carry the water for quite a while, 15 minutes from a, from a water hose. So that's where we had our shower. We had um, yeah, a very simple uh, hut in that where we just uh, slept and did some work. We fight against millions of flies and uh, please don't look at the right corner. That's only for sundown, yeah, uh, the tri chin. And of course for disinfection, internal disinfection, sometimes it's necessary. Um, of course, we had some um, companions in these uh, little houses, uh, which were uh, scorpions. So you have to be careful not to step on them. We had uh, fairly big spiders hanging around, which was good. They keep away the mosquitoes as well as these nice little cute geckos. They are very helpful uh, keeping the, the inside of, the, of, the, of these little houses uh, insect free when it comes to mosquitoes on that. Yeah. And that was our campsite all the time having um, people around watching what we are doing um, and we, we enjoyed that. That was always nice to explain and to let the kids look through the microscope we built up there. Yeah, that's our working place and you see my colleague Lothar, he's uh, just uh, doing some algae work and I, I had my breakfast and it was uh, toast banana and uh, natural honey which we, we buy from locals there. And then on other days, we had a meal which is made of banana, honey, and toast. Um, and then, of course, in, in some rare extensions, we have really honey, toast, and banana. And we had these for several weeks. So in that uh, research, I, I lost more than eight kilograms, um, which made my former girlfriend very happy on that. So coming back slim, that was really good on that. But it was like it is, and um, we just lived with that, and that was okay. Um, that's fine. So with, what we did is we took water samples and we put them through these cartridges um, not to, to have uh, liters of water with us. So back in Berlin, we analyzed these samples with uh, LCMSMS, with uh, mass spectrometry. And on the top, an A, you see different uh, uh, reference toxins we had in my lab. And uh, in uh, the chromatogram in uh, number B, you see, and you can just compare that we see already that we have four cyanobacterial toxins, mainly microcystins, 
in the samples from Lake Nakuo. Um, we were sampling all the other lakes as well, and we find uh, similar patterns, sometimes more toxins, sometimes less toxins in the water of that. We also had uh, analyzed the algae, algae filters, and we found the, the same toxins in the algae itself. So what we did is we sampled, of course, the organs of the dead birds, which will be is the, the brain, the liver, the kidney, the stomach, the intestine, and also the feathers. Uh, why the feathers? Because birds do it like the humans. They put toxins in um, the feathers, and when they, when they just lose the feathers, they get rid of the toxins. The humans are doing the same with hair. So if you have uh, an over amount of toxin, you can just have it in the hair. And with that, sometimes when you're losing hair, you are losing the toxins. But as you can see from the numbers, we find quite a bit of uh, microgram per gram fresh weight in the different organs, even in the brain of the birds. Um, and um, that was um, our first results uh, sampling really hundreds of these birds and then analyzing them back home in Berlin. So that was what we were doing. And uh, we thought that's easy, problem solved, work done, report to the ministry, getting the cash, and that's it. Um, but not really. Because we were looking at the, at the amounts of toxins in the different organs. And for the microsystems, it's not enough to kill the birds. So that was the outcome of, of the first trip to, to Africa. We find toxins, um, but no, the toxins are not really enough to kill these birds. Coming home, eight kilo less, you know what the Bavarian is doing. He is, of course, going first uh, to the Hofbräuhaus, House, which is our uh, main Bavarian restaurant. And we also have luckily one in Berlin. So Bavarian food, music, and beer, um, just to cope for the eight kilograms. And I met with a friend of mine, and he is a, he is a doctor at the Charity um, uh, Hospital in Berlin. And of course, he was asking, how is it? How was it in Africa? What did you do? And I, I explained to him, I showed him this picture of this bird and explained that I could put this bird on his legs up and even nothing was moving. So the, the, the neck is like that and, and the, uh, the wings are like that and it's like frozen and that. And he said, oh, that's interesting. And he showed me one of his pictures and said, look, this is an Ophistotonus. And an Ophistotonus is a hyperextension caused by spasm of the axial muscles along the spinal column. You have to think about, we already had some beers on that. And uh, to get this sentence in the correct way, I know why he is the medicine doctor and I'm only an ecotoxicologist. So this can be correlated to lithium, strychnine, cyanine, poisonings, and all working on the central nervous system. So we have pretty similar, the same in humans, what we see in the birds. And he said, you have to look at neurotoxins, Stefan, and uh, go back into your lab and do that. Um, two days later, as I said, it was some beers in between. I went back into my lab and we were just analyzing all the samples again on these neurotoxins. And one candidate we had, of course, was anatoxin A, this neurotoxin, which I showed you before. And yes, we found them. We found them in, in the organs of the flamingo. So here, 166, that's the mass peak of anatoxin A. And we also find the same peak here <clears throat> in the liver of lesser flamingos in an amount of up to five microgram fresh, per gram fresh weight on that. And in several organs, including the brain as well. So as you can see, the main amount is in the liver, but we have um, an amount of toxin of this neurotoxin already in the brain. There's nothing in the kidneys, but in stomach, intestine, and feathers, we find this neurotoxin as well. And that would explain why these birds are so staggering around, not able to keep the heads up anymore uh, and ending up with these Ophistotonus. So that's, again, when we went to other lakes, this is Lake Bogoria, so a little bit up. Um, and we see the same effect here, birds staggering around. Um, normally they are in this group, these birds which are really intoxicated, they are mostly separated, they are walking around alone and being, of course, with that, an easy prey for the marabouts. 
The ecological reasons, yeah. Um, after finding out that it's maybe cyanobacterial neurotoxins killing the birds, we were looking at the lake itself with other colleagues um, from uh, University of Oldenburg, and they were looking at these lakes together with the colleagues from uh, uh, the university in Kenya, and they see that with historical data, these lakes are getting smaller and smaller and smaller because of the climate change of the dryness in this area. And with that, of course, um, all contaminants which are in these lakes are accumulating and getting uh, uh, in a higher concentration. We have rose farmers taking too much water out of the lake in addition. Um, and with that, pumping in the used water from the rose farmers, which uh, contains a lot of nutrients. So we get a eutrophication effect in the lake. And then we have general pollution like pesticides, heavy metals, which you all find in these lakes. And it's a big mix in that. So <clears throat> when we published our first results, um, we got uh, quite a bit of a media attraction. So we were in several uh, newspapers. We were in National Geographic. We even had our flamingo pictures on a German uh, um, journal by Biologie in unserer Zeit, so a science journal. And um, that's how we uh, get around to, to show the people that it's um, eutrophication, it's the toxins from cyanobacteria, but it's also pesticides, heavy metals, which contributes to the death of these wonderful birds. So that's the work of CSI ecotoxicology and oops, no, sorry, that's the wrong picture. That's the correct picture. So CSI ecotoxicology, and we, we just solved a little bit or we contributed to solving this issue, which is still going on. We still have flamingo deaths in a recent amount of numbers nowadays um, because the situation itself in Africa did not change a lot, unfortunately. As usual, there's some of our publications on this topic. And if you're interested in that, drop me an email and I can send the PDFs to you. Um, with that, I would like to um, say thank you. The first one is a little bit difficult because it's in, mem in memoriam of Eckhard Vareshi, a colleague of mine from University of Oldenburg and his wife. We lost them um, with an accident in Africa uh, on September 16th, 2005. They were both killed um, sleeping in their tent when a tree was falling on their trend or on their tent and it's till today not clear whether that was an accident or really uh, something worse on that. I also like to thank um, our African colleague Kiplakat Kotut. He was wonderful and fantastic and a good colleague to cooperate to do all this work in Africa. Lothar Krinitz, IGB Berlin, um, main driving force for that and a wonderful expert in the identification of cyanobacteria and um, on the different species. Jeffrey A. Cott, my mentor from University of Dundee, where I learned how to work with cyanobacteria and to analyze that. And then, of course, all these students from my group in Berlin, um, which are wonderful and which helped me with that research. And without them, I would not be able to tell you all these stories. So thanks to them. Thanks to you for listening, and I'm open for questions as usual. Super, thank you very much. That was really interesting and, uh, and uh, a great connection with the uh, the CSI component. So um, we we have one question that's been posted so far. I don't know if there is on, on the YouTube yet. So it's, do you still eat toast, bananas, and honey? Yes, I do. <laughs> Not every day, um, but I still eat them, yeah. And I can tell you the honey, it was raw honey from a local which we buy at the street. It was fantastic. Uh, it was real honey, no technical modified one. So it was really good. Okay, great. So some more questions. And there's two of the same question that have just come in literally at the same time. So is there effects on humans if they're drinking this water? So any so any studies being done on people drinking the lake water? Yeah, we were following up, of course, on that um, because cyanobacteria can harm humans as well. So they make you cancer. 
the neurotoxin can work on you as well if there's BMAA uh, in the samples, which we found, of course. You can suffer from Alzheimer and Parkinson, and we were just uh, yeah, informing the Kenyan authorities on that, that the water is not really in a drinking shape. Um, they delivered um, disinfectant tablets, tablets to the people around the lake. Um, on our next visit um, to the lakes, we asked the people um, if there was any progress on that, and they showed us proudly the tablets and said, we are not using them. Their taste is terrible, you know. Um, they And we asked them, how do you use it? And they said, yeah, they are like little sweets. We eat them. Uh, and I said, did anyone tell you how to use disinfectant tablets? And they said, no, they just brought it and said, go on with that. And of course, a chlorine tablet in the mouth is not what you would like to have. Right. So we, we said to them, first of all, you should filter the water through several layers of clothes, then put the tablet in and you know, hopefully you can then drink it. Um, that's what, what we could do. Of course, and then now it comes again, um, the, the lecture, which I'm not allowed to do at the moment, because <laughs> we we'll save it for next year, right. yes. is uh, the lectures on green liver. And that's one of the ideas which was born there, seeing the people drinking the bad water. Mm. Okay. So another question has come in similar in vain, which is, um, Oh, there was a question about children. Um, I'm not sure what happened to you, but basically the question was about, does it impact, um, so we talked about drinking water, but what about children playing in the water? Sort of you had, you had that picture with, with your leg in it. So yeah. what is the impact for the children splashing and running around and that kind of thing? Um, they take up these toxins we are playing in the water, of course, um, up to 500 milliliters a day, just playing in the water, not even drinking the water, but you always have to keep in mind, they use the water for cooking and for drinking. Mm. So the playing is, um, is really minor on that. Um, more severe is that they use it as they are drinking water and food source on, on that. And it has an effect um, when you are over a certain threshold, when it comes to microsystem, you end up with liver cancer. Okay, well, that's very serious. Um... Okay, thank you for that. Um, a few more questions have come through. So is there any way of correcting it? There's always ways correcting that. Um, some of the ways might hurt, and this is shutting down rose farmers around the lakes, which pollute the environment. Um, that would be one possibility. Um, I think from my point of view, to shut down an industry which gives work is something which we should rethink, but um, there are possibilities to help them with water cleaning so that they can clean the wastewater before it enters the lake again, removing nutrients, removing pesticides, removing uh, the over excess of, of um, yeah, what they have inside the water before it enters the lake again. And this is where we might get uh, around with them, helping them to get better, to be, to be more ecological. Mm, and um, yeah, that would for sure help. Um, the water outtake from the lake for these rose farmers is an issue because it contributes really a lot to um, the lake getting smaller and smaller in a, in a time where we have these climate change and really hot summers and uh, not so much rain anymore. So it has to be really and concept to reuse and uh, use water in a in a more sustainable way, what is done at the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so, could touching the feathers of the birds be harmful? No, so like the, the boys making the flowers, for example. Yeah, um, the toxin is really bound inside the feather structure, so it will not come out. Um, and uh, by the way, that's that's uh, the way how you can see um, when you look at the hair of Beethoven um, and then you analyze the hairs of, of this musician, you see that there's a lot of arsenic in his hair, which people think on his might be killed on that um, 
but this is how we are doing it. Birds are putting toxins in their feathers and get rid of them. Humans are doing the same with the hair. But if you touch mm -hmm. hairs or feather, you will be not intoxicated. No. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Um, as we as we wait for some more questions to come in. So I'm sorry, I don't know if you'd mentioned this earlier in the presentation, but approximately how many flamingos have died as a result of this? A few millions. A few million. And about how long has this been going on for? I had the first reports, as I said, were in 1991 when people are really starting counting the birds. Um, okay. And it goes on till today. Wow. And is it increasing or staying the same in terms of the, the number of deaths? It's, yeah, it's very fluctuating. You know, that's yeah. that's how it is. Um, um, and, and it depends, of course, on the development of these cyanobacterial blooms in the lake. And sometimes you have strains of these cyanobacteria which are not so toxic. Um, and sometimes you don't have so much heavy metals in the lake. You don't have okay. so much pes pesticides flushed in. So right. it really depends on what is on the menu at the moment. And that's why um, flamingos are dying more or less. But it's it's an up and down, but under the line, it's going up. Yeah. Right. So if there's more rain, less deaths? Yeah, if there yeah. would be more water in the lake, mm -hmm. it would dilute for sure. The right. Thing. Right. It would not get rid of the problems, but... Um, Dilution might be a temporary solution. Mm -hmm. Now, I know your study focused on flamingos, but were they seeing, um, have there been similar uh, similar impacts on other animals that perhaps fellow I mean, researchers are looking at? Yeah, we were, of course, looking at marabous, which are feeding on the, on the contaminated flamingos. Okay. And we found out that they have a very, very good uh, detoxication system in their liver. But this is to be expected living on dead carcasses of course. and so they, they they are very stable on that um we were just looking at uh, fish um whether fish are contaminated as well and they they have toxins as expected when you live in a toxic environment so that's that's how it is everything is affected on that um for sure, if we just connect to the to the last presentation on, on food items, if you use this lake water for watering your salad, your onions, you transfer the toxins into these food items for sure. Right. Okay. Um, there's another question on Slido, mm -hmm. and it's about, uh, is this a problem in other lakes in Africa? Are you familiar with that? Yeah, we have similar issues at um, most of the Rift Valley lakes I've visited so far. Um, also, Lake Victoria seen more and more these cyanobacterial blooms coming up. Um, so, it's an it's an issue of eutrophication on water management on how these are, these lakes are used for. Hmm. I see. Okay. Um, I don't know if I'm guessing uh, Teddy, who's in uh, our IST, who's in the background, who's monitoring YouTube. I assume there's probably no YouTube questions that have come through uh, at the moment. I just want to make sure that I'm capturing capturing all the questions from our viewers right now. So seeing none, I'll just put another call out there. Just anybody, any questions that you may have um, for our Dean here, uh, related or even unrelated to this particular study. Um, he, he does have much expertise in a number of different areas in ecotoxicology. Um, so, you know, what's, what's next on your research as we're waiting, what's next in your research? Are you going to be doing more research on flamingos specifically or on these bodies of water in Africa specifically? we are looking to other locations there, there are people doing that mm -hmm. um but um i'm my next research is really on microplastics and, and right. um, what i'm doing in in that context we are still working with uh, cyanobacterial toxins on that and trying to combine all these toxins with microplastic and whether microplastic is a vessel or a transporter for these toxins um that mm -hmm. might be a, a case so that's uh, what is the interest at the moment. And of course, implementing these green liver systems, which I'm not allowed to talk about that, <laughs> know that. Um, but implementing these systems, maybe or seeing how we can implement them here in Manitoba to get the lakes a little bit uh, in a better shape and to get mm -hmm. people having a good source for drinking water. Because mm -hmm. water boiling act is not really what we would like to see 
internationally as well. Of course, yes. Um, Ted, if you want to bring YouTube, because I've uh, not YouTube, sorry, the Slido question, because it is specific to mm -hmm. Leave to Lake Winnipeg. So does this affect Manitoba lakes besides Lake Winnipeg? I've seen blooms on Lake of the Woods. Uh, when do we know it's a serious problem? Get me to measure that. Okay. Uh, that's, that's how it is. Um, yeah. Seeing a bloom does not really mean it's toxic. Okay. Um, that's that's how it is. Um, but uh, vice versa, it's not it's not not toxic. Yeah. So it can be toxins inside, and the only way to see it is really to analyze it. So taking water samples, get it in the lab, get it analyzed, and then we can tell you what it is. There's um, uh, a rule of thumb, I think it's called here. Um, mm -hmm. When you walk into the water and you can see your your toes in the water when you walk into the water up to your knees and you can see your toes um that's okay then you can just swim in there mm -hmm. if you don't see your toes anymore get your things and get out of the water that's how it is um so what i was doing in africa walking in um i couldn't see my my toes anymore that was dangerous and i know that but it was only short term um if people are doing it the whole day or more often it certainly has an effect because toxins were taken up through the skin and that's not good of course mm -hmm. okay that is a good rule of thumb the next time i'm in a lake i'll make sure to do that uh we have a related question on slido to do with uh lake winnipeg i believe it is uh would the algae blooms in lake winnipeg have toxins similar to these in african lakes Sorry, I didn't didn't sort so of bring it back. So, so the algae blooms in Lake Winnipeg would they have similar uh, uh, have toxins similar to the to the ones in African lakes that you yeah. Mentioned? So we, we were we were sampling nearly all over the world, and what we see is that certain bacteria develop a certain set of toxins, and um, most of them are the microcystins. So we we expect that we see the microcystins here in Lake Winnipeg as well or Lake Manitoba or Lake of the Woods that will be always the same uh, and it de depends on which variant and it depends whether it's spiced up with some neurotoxins if there's BMAA inside yes or no but uh, actually it's always a toxic uh, a cocktail of toxins mm -hmm. and um, yeah it depends on the region but yeah the the, the main things are always the same one so they're always the same. Okay. Yeah. Um, there was a question that came through on YouTube. Very interesting. And it's um, this idea of dropping hair to get rid of toxins. Is this why people lose their hair when given chemotherapy? No, definitely not. It's, no. Uh, it's because the chemotherapy chemicals are killing the roots of the hairs. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. I believe there is another question on Slido. Oh, yeah. Uh, have wells been drilled as a safer source of water? Yeah, we have several charity organizations who are doing that, um, but it's it's really hard um, mm -hmm. to to find water in in their places. Um, so most of the most of the time, people will use surface water for that. Wells would be more safe. Yeah, but um, they. Yeah, it's it's simple. It's simple too much work to do that. So um, they they can't do it for every little community there. Um, and um, but they are doing what they, what is necessary. We saw them drilling wells. Um, we saw the water. We analyzed the water, and it was okay. But still, smaller communities will use surface water. And what we develop with this green liver system and with a mobile one, which I would present them next year, mm -hmm. you can see there's possibilities to provide them with clean water until these wells are drilled. Hmm. Okay. All right. Good to know. Um, I'll just put another last call out there, but I have a question on in just as we're talking about bodies of water in general, and you were just mentioning that it's uh, every body of water, there's some cocktail of toxins, as you refer to it, uh, mm -hmm. generally around the world. Um, I, to your knowledge, what would be the cleanest body of water on our planet? Or in what area of the world would be cleaner? Good question on that. Um, groundwater normally is filtered through several layers of rocks, and that would be a source of, of uh, good water on that. Um, going to remote areas might help as well, um, but um, 
we have to we have to really a little bit get rid of there are safe areas on this plan planet because we have wind action we have water flowing around and contaminants they don't know any borders that's how it is so if we have air pollutants they will not they will not uh, stick in a certain area mm -hmm. they, they will not be only in the us or only in canada or only in europe they will fly all over the planet and with that contamination is a worldwide issue so there's no really a safe place but there are maybe places where it's more at the moment still more clean than on other sides yeah. mm -hmm. okay but let's work to make these most contaminated sites more clean again yes that would be helpful mm -hmm. absolutely okay i don't think there's any more questions i don't see any in slido and teddy i assume if you haven't posted anything in the chat that there isn't anything from youtube so uh with that so everybody who's on the call just uh we've talked a lot about bodies of water and blue green algae so stay tuned uh for uh when we when we release our our sessions in 2022 we're going to try to do another whole climate series um uh themed um uh, virtual learning for life series where we have um, the Dean with us again to speak on the topic he's he's just he's talked about as well as some of his colleagues from the faculty on uh, on the Arctic sea ice lots of uh, lots of really great groundbreaking research being conducted here at the University of Manitoba for which all of us as alumni should be very proud so we will be sharing that news uh, with you very soon uh, thank you Dr. Flug McCurley I mean thank thank you for not just this week but last week and the week before. And so I encourage everybody who's on this call, please check out the previous two weeks. Um, it's really great information and things that all of us as human beings should really be aware of and, and some tangible things in which we can change our own behavior to make our world a, a better place. Uh, so stay tuned, everybody, in terms of what the sessions look like in 2022. We appreciate your flexibility as the topics and presenters have changed week to week uh, because of uh, we've been navigating the, the current labor disruption at the university. Uh, so we'll share more with you in the new year as to what uh, the rest of the year looks like. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us uh, in alumni relations at alumni at umanitoba. .ca. So thank you again for participating. Check out our other sessions, as I've mentioned, uh, and we will see you in 2022. Thank you.